Good evening. My name is Hadi Kamara, and I'm the managing director here at Arena Stage. I wanted to take a quick moment and welcome you all this evening. This is our fourth iteration of the Arena Civil Dialogues, and tonight we are talking about the, rob the robots that are coming. Um, this is, as I said, our fourth iteration. The last three were so successful that we really committed to do these more frequently and throughout the season. The next three are already scheduled and on the back of your programs, so please lo look at those dates, and if you're interested in any of those topics, I hope that you go online and reserve as you get home this evening. And without further ado, I would like to introduce and welcome our curator and moderator, Professor Amitai Etzioni, and I'll pass it on to you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Hadi, it's been great to work with you. Endless emails, phone calls, and meetings, uh, that is really the secret of the success of the program. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for uh, despite the threat of violence in the streets and closing metro stations <laughs> and pouring rain, you showed your civic virtue by uh, joining us today, so thank you all. There's a medal being casted as we speak, and on your way out, you're going to get one. Uh, uh, let me also say that in a much more serious way, uh, we wanted, the reason we created that series is to show that people of different backgrounds and different opinions can have a civilized dialogue. <laughs> and no, this halt, what's happening out there, where people shout at each other rather than dialogue, is kind of a perfect background to what we're trying to do here today. Now, our, our subject today is uh, uh, what artificial intelligence is doing to us. And uh, the line I often hear that it's in making, going to make all our instruments, everything we use from uh, vacuum cleaners to cars uh, smarter, uh, giving it a brain, be able to process information and make decisions. Uh, for me, this sounds very abstract. It kind of washes over me. So I'd like to share with you uh, 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 an extremely simple example which for me uh, uh, explains, uh, illustrates what it's all about. Uh, so most of us at home have a thermostat. And when we want it to be warmer or colder, we go and punch in a number or a dial. Or, but we have to command it, each change we want to make in the temperature. That would be called a, a stupid thermostat in the future. The smart one, which exists, that's not a theory, you can buy it, uh, observes the household for two weeks, discerns the patterns of behavior, and in addition has a motion sensor. And when it notes that nobody's at home, it puts the temperatures on energy efficient levels, and then when it realizes people are about to come home, or whatever, or about to go to bed, it changes the temperature accordingly, and you have to do nothing. That's a smarter <coughs> thermometer. So the same thing, thermostat. So the same thing, I, this way I can imagine, uh, hap happened to practically everything we touch from our refrigerators to our cars. So tonight we're gonna discuss this uh, idea in three areas. First about the, the threat that artificial intelligence wanna kill a lot of jobs, the way it killed most elevator operators, and the uh, argument on both sides, those who think it's a very serious threat on those who are somewhat less uh, concerned. And then we're gonna hear about what it does to weapons, which uh, some people believe are increasingly becoming autonomous, uh, make decisions on their own, and when you send them after the tanks of the other side, they may end up blowing up your tanks. Uh, then we're gonna introduce to those of you who are not familiar with a term which I ne never heard about before, called singularity. And you can live many happy years, I assure you, without knowing what singularity is, <laughs> but we'll, we'll spot it for you tonight, and we'll hear uh, that it's the code word for the danger that the computers will go and enslave us. And you'll hear that some very serious people uh, losing sleep at night over that uh, issue. And finally, uh, uh, we're going to have somebody who uh, wrap it all up and put it in a box in a lovely 
uh, born uh, band around it. So uh, uh, Molly, we start us with the worries. Let me say, we're not going to introduce the speakers. Their uh, bios are in your uh, programs. Would you please? Great, thank you very much. Well, it is such a pleasure to see so many of you here at this beautiful theater. I can see the rain and lightning behind us, so it really is a testament to all of your interest in this topic and your civic mindedness. Um, just to start out, how many of you have read a newspaper or magazine article suggesting that robots are here to take all of our jobs? Most of you, okay, great. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you believe at least part of that? Okay, so we have, so good panels have differences of opinions. I will say I'm the worrier, I think, of this panel when it comes to jobs, although I'm not apocalyptic, so I apologize I'm not on the, the far extreme of this topic. Um, before we get into this question, are, are robots taking our jobs, I wanna just talk a little bit about the different ways technology changes work. And there's some good news, some mixed news, and some bad news. So to start out with the good news, there's no question that technological change creates fantastic job opportunities. There are so many people who hold jobs today, including in this city, that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. Social media managers, who would have heard of that term 10 years ago? We're gonna be talking maybe about drones, drone operators. There's so many jobs in um, IT, machine learning. Um, so there's no question that when we look out in the future, we should feel some optimism that technological change is gonna make for excellent opportunities for many of us. The second reality is for most people, technology won't be a new job or won't eliminate their job. It will change people's jobs, sometimes in small ways and sometimes in big ways. For a lot of people, particularly for very educated and highly skilled people, Technology might be very drudgery reducing. So having a sort of a virtual assistant might take away some of your time booking appointments without, if you're not senior enough to have, like me who doesn't have my own administrative assistant, something like that actually might save me some time. For some professions, technology, think of a radiologist. Part of their, their task might be done by a machine. That's probably gonna pivot how they use their, their talents. It won't take away their job necessarily, but it might change the way they work. And the best example we have of that is ATM machines. When those were first introduced a few decades ago, there were lots of apocalyptic headlines that all bank tellers would lose their job. Immediately, like in the years following the introduction of the ATM, that didn't happen actually. Um, ATMs lowered the cost for banks to open a new branch. And they changed the role of the teller from just handling cash to being really customer facing. They became the prime customer service oriented person at a bank. Um, the job for some people actually became higher skilled and higher pay. Now of course bank branches are closing because of other technolo technological changes, but it's important to note that for a lot of people they'll find some of their work change. Um, and third, there is of course going to be some displacement. There will be jobs that will be impacted. Um, and let me give you a little sense of the characteristics that we anticipate of the jobs that are more vulnerable to automation, and I use four terms. One is routine. So jobs that follow rules, they're very routine. You do the same thing. It doesn't require creativity or judgment. It's sort of very routine jobs. Those are very much at risk. Um, second is predictable, same type of thing, sort of following similar rules. To some extent, manual. And third is sort of emotion list. Jobs that, tasks that don't require persuading a person or selling to a person or empathizing. Um, those four characteristics are the things that are really at risk. And it, the best example we have from looking in the past for automation changing work is the factory floor. So we're all very familiar with how manufacturing jobs have changed. Um, it's not that manufacturing jobs have been eliminated. So we might hear about the elevator operator totally being gone. It's that there's been a change in the demand for workers with certain skills. So since 2000, there are five million fewer manufacturing jobs. Those are typically the jobs that are described by those four words I just said. So someone working on an assembly line, that's routine, predictable, manual, and, and emotionless. The demand for uh, manufacturing workers with a high school degree has plummeted by a third. Whereas workers with a graduate degree, the demand for them have in increased. Um, so it's really the shifts in the, in the type of work that, it, that we're thinking more about. Um, when I think about some of the, the job categories in the future that are at risk, um, I think of particularly lower skilled frontline work. So jobs that don't require a lot of preparation, a lot of advanced skill, cashiers. That's actually the number one job in the, the DMV area is cashier. Biggest job, almost twice as many cashiers in DC, Maryland, and Virginia than, than lawyers even. Huge number of cashiers. If you think about the changes, McDonald's has pledged to go completely cashierless um, by 2020. 
Amazon Go, a lot of you have heard of this futuristic Amazon convenience store that has almost no employees. There's been a lot of talk that some big competitors that are more sort of in communities are, are experimenting with similar. Cashiers are at risk. Food preparation, people who make hamburgers. There's a lot of innovation happening to replace a lot of that straightforward work. So some of this low-skilled work is very much at risk. The data suggests that the highest risk workers are those with a high school degree or less making lower wages. Um, and the thing that keeps me up at night is that the jobs that are projected to grow in the future because of technological change tend to require a lot more education skill than the jobs that are going to be replaced which in some ways is a good thing. We want lots of good jobs created. The question is, for the people who might be displaced, are they able to connect to the good jobs that are going to be coming online? Machine learning jobs, nursing jobs, some of these jobs that are projected to increase are not necessarily in the same location or going to be accessible to the same people that might be seeing some of that change. So what I worry about with, tech, with technological change in work is not that we're going to a future where nobody has a job. The question is, for those who are already vulnerable in our economy, who have the least access to training and good education, um, that don't have some of the skills for these very creative or interpersonal or complex thinking or math-oriented jobs that stand to be in more demand, um, are they going to be able to connect to those jobs? And how are we going to make that transition accessible to people? So again, I'm not apocalyptic, but I do worry about how we're going to empower more workers to be able to connect to decent opportunity um, in, a, in an era of a lot of change. Well, Molly, take just one more minute. Sure. Earlier, you had some data yes. where you told us what happens when we try to retrain people. Okay. Can you just... Quickly, right, so quickly? oftentimes, and I'm sure I sit on a lot more panels about future work than a lot of you, that a lot of the times that the response is, I read a long report on how technology is changing work. And often the sort of punchline is, don't worry, there's lots of change ahead. If we can just retrain a third of the entire workforce to be prepared for another job will be fine. So there's a lot of the sense of the sort of technocratic solution is retrain. I am a huge believer that this country is not ready, uh, not prepared with an educational system that's ready for someone in the middle of their career to pivot to another job. We need to provide much more accessible, shorter, um, allowing people to keep their job, work on the side, upskill. There's no question that this country has a lot of work to do to pave the way for people to change their career and pivot and get new skills. However, a lot of the people who are most at risk of automation are not necessarily the ones who are going to be getting going to General Assembly and DuPont Circle and taking an IT course on Python. It's just not necessarily realistic, and I'm going to be doing a lot of human-centered research, interviewing some of these frontline workers to better understand the really real structural constraints. They've got families, they make minimum wage, there's no savings, they can't quit their job and go to a full-time study. Um, there's a lot of challenges, and in fact, the data suggests that a lot of frontline, lower skill workers don't advance in their career already. Um, there was a study that came out from the Federal Reserve in New York recently that looked at, um, over a 12-month period, people in sort of really pretty bad frontline jobs that don't have any benefits, no stability, what percent of them moved into a slightly better job, left the workforce, or changed to a similar job? And only 5% of those workers in a year moved up into a slightly better job. And that tells us there's some real constraints and real barriers. So the notion that we can just wave a magic wand and empower, we, we should be finding every which way, whether it's childcare, providing on-the-job training. Uh, but I think the challenge is actually a pretty great one. And to sort of make simplistic statements about retraining is going to sort of solve the problem, I think, leaves us in a lurch. Well, thank you, and I just want to echo everybody's, uh, what the other panelists have said so far about how great it is that you've all shown up today. Uh, that is uh, really warms my heart to see you here because, uh, you know, you could be watching Netflix or just hiding under your bed given other stuff that's happening here in town today, so thank you for being here. Uh, I'm often asked to be on panels like this because uh, I, I'm viewed as somewhat of a counterfoil to the notion that the robots are coming and taking over. Uh, and, and, and I think that's a, a somewhat of a, a misnomer because uh, it's not that I uh, uh, disbelieve that uh, uh, technology could be displacing of labor in the future. It's that um, we just don't know. So I'd like to make three points. And uh, one is that uh, history has actually been quite unkind 
to the assumption that technology is going to displace large amounts of workers. This is not the first uh, uh, kind of run at this, at this concern. In fact, uh, um, I have a little uh, uh, imaginary anecdote. Is, uh, if, if, uh, if you imagine that I was Thomas Jefferson's chief economist, and I am old enough to be that, uh, <laughs> and, and I ran into his office and I said, uh, President Jefferson, I, I, you're going you're gonna to be shocked. Uh, uh, I, I just looked into the future, and instead of 90% of the workforce in agriculture, which was the case when when he was president, I looked into the future and it's 2%. 2% of the labor force will be in agriculture. So we have a disaster on our hands, which is the tenor of some of these panels. It's not at all where Molly was coming from. She's much more nuanced than that at all. I want to be clear about that. In fact, you and I land in the same place and uh, we're, we're, we're closer than, than I, I might have thought. Uh, but that would have been a big mistake uh, to get uh, President Jefferson that wound up about, about that because Technology not only destroys opportunities, it creates opportunities. And so the first point is that the Luddites have always been wrong about this point. And oh, that, oh, three times. Uh, well, uh, however many times. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that you know, there, there's always the chance that this time will be different. Uh, but that brings me to so, so my first point is, is uh, the future is unknowable. Economists are terrible. We, we forecast the future all the time, but we're really bad at it. And for some reason, that doesn't stop us from doing it. Uh, yet we keep doing it, and we keep being wrong about it. So I very much discount predictions about the future. That doesn't mean I don't worry about it. And as you'll see, I land in exactly the same place Molly does in terms of worries. But it's much more about job quality than job quantity, which brings me to my second point. While the future is, uh, in my view, both unknowable and, at least in historical terms, less worrisome than many of these panels cast it to be, the present is a very strong example of uh, how strong labor demand uh, and uh, job creation is in an economy that is saturated with technology. Uh, and there are experts on the panel who, will, who can go much deeper into this than I can, but it certainly seems to me that we have uh, a lot more technology in the economy and the workforce than we've ever had. That's probably something that would always be true. Uh, but um, yet, here we are at 3.9% unemployment, creating a couple of hundred thousand jobs every month, and employers are clamoring that they can't find the workers they need. Now, they don't seem to want to raise pay very much, so uh, there is a little sim there's a problem in there, and I'm going to get to that as my third point. But my second point is that the present, at any rate, is not uh, very supportive of the notion of technology displacing employment to the point where we have some sort of a fundamental or structural job creation problem. Uh, now, um, um, and so, so my, th and, and so, if you're thinking that my rap is kind of what me worry, like, sure, the future is going to be fine, you're wrong. I am an economist, so I, I carry the dark and dismal card around in my pocket, just like all of my brothers and sisters. And, and here, but, but the thing that I worry about, see, I, I, I think the present is much scarier than the future. Uh, and, and so I think that, what, that, that, the, that, that the, the concerns about the future of work, to me, are very much the concerns about the past of work and the present of work. And that has to do with where Molly landed, but while she was worrying about this kind of towards the future, that is, that, the, that people will they'll be, you know, I don't know if this is, I don't, I'm paraphrasing, you correct me if I'm wrong, Molly, but, but it's not so much a job quantity problem, it's a job quality problem, that people won't have the skills to uh, make the earnings they need to improve their living standards. That is something that I've worried about in the past because it's been true, it's true in the present, and I fear it will be true in the future. If you look at the projections of the occupations that are adding the most jobs in the future, they're not necessarily, some of them are sort of high end and uh, have to do with technology and computerization and dig digitalization. Many of them don't. Some of them are home health aides, child care workers, people in retail, uh, and uh, th those jobs, particularly in the healthcare sector, are actually very hard to automate. Many of them are probably not automatable, but uh, child care workers are a good example. Child care workers are massively underpaid in this country, and that is a problem today, and it will be a problem in the future. 
So if we want to worry about something, let's worry less about the unknowable future and worry more about what we can do to improve the quality of future jobs, whatever they are. That has to, and I, I, perhaps later in our discussion I'll talk about what that means, but ultimately it has a lot to do with bargaining power because less educated workers have less bargaining power. Unions are much less a, a function in our economy. It has to do with labor standards. So as work evolves in such a way that the employment relationship is at a longer arm's length between workers and their employers, think of the gig economy, which by the way is a tiny part of the economy, but it's a growing part. And it's one wherein you can be considered a contracted worker, which takes you out from under the umbrella of many critically important protections, overtime, minimum wages, labor standards, safety rules. We have to bring those jobs back under the protection of labor standards. We have to give workers the bargaining clout they need so that whatever jobs they have, they have the opportunity to do better in the future than they are doing in the present. Well, I, I want to challenge you on this uh, just a little because I know from previously being on a panel with you, you can take it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not worried that you. Uh, so the, the, on this last point, we say, where's the problem? We have almost full employment, but the new jobs are shitty jobs. And so uh, instead of having decent pay and rich benefits, more and more of these jobs have been low paying right. to the point that people need to do extra work to drive Uber and such to make right. a living. And above all, enormous cut in benefits. And above all, and that's what we talk least about, surprisingly, insecurity. Yeah. So uh, it, it, we know from the other studies that uh, a job is not a job is not a job. And for, there is a, one little account which symbolizes for me the issue. Pilots now, they used to be a very dignified, well-paying, glamorous job. Many pilots now, now on this, what, this gig or contingent labor, what that means, they have to stand by and they're called on the spot if a pilot is needed. They don't get paid for the period in between and they can't do any other job because if they're not, when they're called, if they're not coming, they will not be called again. So they get no benefits, low salary, and they don't have a life. Now, you multiply that uh, in other areas, and it's true that we don't know to what degree the contingent economy is going, but it's clearly a big, important sector. More and more employers prefer to have people that don't have, don't have to worry about their benefits. Yeah. So in short, are we, is not automation, if not creating outright unemployment, filling the slots Forgive me for putting it in simple no. English. No, no, you're actually, this is not a challenge, you're underscoring my main point. That's exactly where I was trying to land, which is that I worry much less that the robots are taking all our jobs such that the unemployment rate will be, you know, 20%, which is, you know, this is the thing Keynes worried about years ago, involuntary technological unemployment. That's not my concern. My concern is the quality of jobs. So let's be very concrete. Now, by the way, for airline pilots, it's a great example because that's a very unequal occupation. That is, there is a group that you're talking about that literally make twenty and $30,000 a year flying airplanes, which is incredible. But if they stay at the job and get selected to the top rung, then they start making six figures. So that's, this very, that, that's kind of a microcosm of the inequality problem. And what I'm trying to suggest is that there are a set of public policy changes, none of which today's you know, Republicans would even think twice about, so let's be clear about that. I, mean, I, I understand that what I'm talking about is contrary to today's politics, but you know, such is the nature of my life these days. Um, if we had a strong, uh, if, if, if we had a guaranteed healthcare system so that everybody uh, had uh, a right to quality health care. Boom, every single job that we're talking about, even an arm's length job in the gig economy, just got a whole, bu whole, bu whole bunch better. <clears throat> if we had a minimum wage, that was where it should be. If we had overtime rules that were what they should be and that they were enforced. If we had a robust wage subsidy system, we have an earned income tax credit, I would ratchet it up, a child. There are a set of public policies, and I can talk more about them during our discussion, that would um, automatically improve the quality of jobs, such that the problem that you're describing, which is very real to me, and I think was where Molly ended as well, um, could be uh, ameliorated. 
Thank you. Now, it may seem like we're gonna go to a completely different place. you see later, they are all connected. Mary. Thank you very much, Professor, and thank you uh, to the arena stage and to all of you for coming out tonight in the rain and all of the other barriers. Um, I work for Human Rights Watch, and I wanted to talk to you about our work uh, to address what we call killer robots, what uh, more uh, formally known as fully autonomous weapon systems. And this is about what happens when machines or robots replace soldiers in warfare or police and law enforcement uh, and in other circumstances. Uh, and this is happening already at the moment. We hear a lot in the military about how robots can be used to do the dirty, the dull, the dangerous jobs, the repetitive tasks, the uh, cleaning of ships, the, the really big uh, kind of boring, dangerous tasks. We also know about uh, explosive ordnance disposal robots and how you can send that in and control it to try and detonate an explosive. Um, what we're concerned about, though, is not that use of uh, artificial intelligence and autonomy. It's what happens when you put it into a weapon system uh, to the point that you no longer have meaningful human control over the critical functions of selecting a target and then firing on it. And those are things that we believe should be under the control of a human at all times rather than a machine. Why? The first reason for us is a moral one. It crosses a moral line for us to permit a machine to do the killing rather than another human. Taking a human life is so grave uh, that for us to kind of outsource it to machines uh, is a step too far. Uh, I want to read you a few lines from my colleague's report, Bonnie Doherty. We have a new report coming out next week about fully autonomous weapons in the Martin's Clause. Um, and in this report, she talks about how you know, most humans possess an innate resistance to killing that is based on their understanding of the impact of the loss of life. Uh, and a machine, a fully autonomous weapon that is an, an inanimate machine, could not share that same understanding uh, of what it means to take another human life. And even if fully autonomous weapons could adequately protect human life, they would be incapable of respecting human dignity. Unlike humans, these robots would be unable to appreciate the full value of human life and the significance of its loss. They could make life and death decisions based on algorithms, reducing their human targets to objects, and they would thus violate the principles of humanity on all fronts. Uh, part of my work involves coordinating a coalition of non-governmental organizations. It's called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. And uh, the Nobel Peace Laureates who are involved in our campaign, uh, they, they, they are also concerned about this crossing of the moral line and also the fact that if you remove the human soldier from the equation, you make it easier to go to warfare, to resort to, to killing by machine. Uh, the other people involved in our campaign, including my own organization, Human Rights Watch, we look at the law, the laws of war, which are a well-established now, uh, body of the law of war. And when we've looked through at would fully autonomous weapons, based on the current technology, be able to distinguish between a soldier and a civilian? At the moment, it's not good. Would they be able to, under that, that, that they would unlike be unlikely to be able to make that distinction? Uh, would they be able to undertake the, pro the, 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 um, the very complex proportionality calculation which a human soldier who's in command of an armed force must take before they invade an area that might have civilians in it? They must weigh up uh, the pros and cons of the military utility of taking a certain action against the potential consequences of, of what could happen to the people on the ground, the civilians on the ground. At the moment, we do not believe that a fully autonomous weapon would be able to, to make that complex uh, calculation. Uh, the fully autonomous weapons raise a host of concerns, uh, what we call the accountability gap, uh, that a weapon system, the manufacturer, the designer, uh, the, 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 the military force that sends this weapon system into battle, uh, would not be able to be held accountable for the actions of a fully autonomous weapon if it were to, if, if things were to go wrong. Uh, 
there are a host of other concerns about just the investments in autonomy and weapon systems and proliferation and starting of arms races. We're starting to see that a little bit at the moment. But we're talking about fully autonomous weapons, about future weapon systems. We're not seeking to prohibit the existing armed drones that are in place today, although they create many issues themselves, they are still under the control of a human soldier who might not necessarily be in the cockpit of the, of the weapon system of the vehicle, uh, but remotely based back in a, in a base, uh, looking through the screen at what uh, the, the drone is seeing and then taking the decision as to whether a target is legitimate or not, uh, and then taking the decision to fire uh, on it. And, and, and that's, those are the things that we want to see remain under some form of human control. For us, meaningful human control, I guess, is the catchphrase. So this is the campaign to stop kill of robots, which has been going now for five years. Within a few months of launching back in 2013, governments uh, very easily uh, started discussing this topic at the United Nations. And we were excited that they took it up so quickly that they didn't kind of come back and say, well, this is all fantasy and, and future-oriented stuff and you've been watching too many Terminator movies and the rest of it. Uh, they looked at the organizations and the individuals who are involved in our campaign, uh, the roboticists like Professor Noel Sharkey, the artificial intelligence experts, the Nobel Peace Laureates, the human rights groups, the lawyers. The, it's a very, very kind of diverse group uh, that, is, that is concerned about this. Uh, and they decided we need, do need to start talking about this topic. So governments have been meeting uh, diplomatically uh, for, they're going to hold their sixth meeting at the end of this month. And they've been talking through the issues that I laid out here, the legal, the technical, operational, uh, moral and ethical concerns raised by what they call lethal autonomous weapon systems. Uh, they've not yet decided on the action to take. And for the campaign to stop killer robots, our goal is clear. We call for a preemptive ban on the development, production and use of fully autonomous weapon systems and for that prohibition to be put in place internationally by international treaty and nationally through national laws. Uh, for us, this is the best way to future-proof uh, war fighting in the future. Um, but it's also not just about the potential use of fully autonomous weapons in warfare. It's about their potential use in law enforcement uh, and in policing and border control and other circumstances. So if we can establish the principle of human control over the use of force and over weapon systems going forward, we'll have a safer planet. Uh, it's not just perhaps to finish a, an evil roboticist in his laboratory who's dreaming up this doomsday weapon called a, a fully autonomous weapon that's driving uh, this concern. It's just the fact that artificial in in intelligence and autonomy is becoming ever more sophisticated and being used in ever more different ways. Uh, and when we put it into a weapon system to the point that we no longer have effective control over what it selects and, and who it kills, uh, that's the line too far. So that's why we call for the preemptive ban. That's, uh, you, you're doing the Lord's work for my own. And, uh, let, let me just ask you to add one sentence or two about the following question. If we are to stop those killer machines, it has to be something most militaries will agree to. Because if one major military will not... Uh, so there's about 80 countries who have been talking about this issue for the last five, six years, and that includes the United States, Russia, and China, the permanent members of the Security Council. Um, and, and throughout these talks, it's been very interesting to see only a couple are willing to even start discussing the potential advantages or benefits of having a fully autonomous weapon. And, and those states are Israel and the United States, I think, and, and Russia to a certain extent. All of the other countries who are involved in this process are far more interested in discussing the concerns uh, and what we can do um, about that. Uh, you know, there are a few, not even states, but a few who will say uh, that it is possible to use these weapon systems in a certain way and, and not in a way that would be harmful to civilians, um, that they can be designed in, in a way that, that um, will, will be, they'll be able to, to make those distinctions that I mentioned before. But a lot of this is also far off projections and 
when it comes down to it, it's the stupid artificial intelligence that's out there now being used in weapon systems that I think is the concern rather than the super intelligent uh, stuff that we, we hear all the time is coming but is obviously not here yet. Thank you. Uh, I promise you you'll hear about singularity. Here it comes. <laughs> okay, I'll start slow. I'm not going to jump into singularity right away or super intelligence. I'll, I'll get you there in a few minutes, okay? So we're all here today to talk about future of technology, future of robotics, future of AI, future of humanity. But we have to define what we mean by future. Are we talking about Tuesday? Are we talking about one year from now, five years from now, 50 years? You can't have consistent answers if you don't even know what time scale we're talking about. I'll agree with most of you that not much is gonna change in one year. You're all gonna have whatever jobs you have, almost all of you military situation, probably UN will take another 400 years to resolve it. Nothing's going to change. I'm interested in deep future, long-term future. I'm a professor. I advise students. I need to tell students what majors to take, what occupations to pick. So by the time they graduate, their jobs are still there. They have some potential of uh, having a long, prosperous career. Is that even a thing? Is that going to happen? Another thing we need to figure out, are we talking about bodies or brains? Robots are bodies. They are very hard to make. Probably the most secure job you'll ever get is a plumber. Because it's difficult to go through all that stuff. Like, it's not trivial. Easy jobs to automate are smart jobs, like accounting. Most accountants are in danger. I hate to say it. I go to those conferences. I show them statistics. They have no idea. But they're not going to have long-term successful careers. And we see it uh, a lot. So you have to be very careful in terms of job selection. If you have young children, yourself selecting college major, you have to understand the impact of this technology, long-term impact. Um, I, I want to kind of address the three questions the panel was supposed to explicitly answer. I'm a professor, I follow directions, so I'm going to give you a yes or no answer, but I will address the time scale issue with that, right? So the first question was, I think, uh, what about the jobs, right? Will the jobs be automated? It really depends on time scale. Short term, most jobs will be secure, new jobs will be created. New exciting jobs, better jobs, it's gonna be wonderful for a while. Very long term, all jobs will be automated. No exception. My job will be the last job to go because I'll create those machines. I'm a computer scientist, AI researcher. But I'm not safe either, so just full disclosure. Now, people immediately go, how soon? How long is it going to take? Is it 2045 is the year? I don't know. I have no idea. I cannot predict the future. But would it make a huge difference if it took 20 years extra? We still need to get ready. We still need to figure out economy. We need to figure out what to do with all these people who have lots of free time now. For many people, they hate their jobs. They would be very happy to get unconditional basic income, sit home, watch Netflix, some people love their jobs. They define themselves with what they do, right? I'm sure my colleagues will agree. So what would I do if I'm no longer the best at what I do? What am I going to do with all this time? How will I engage with other people? We can still consider certain occupations meaningful because they are man-made, handmade. So maybe art is beautiful because a person made it. Even if a machine can make equal painting or equally good song. So there is still some incentive to produce, to be creative, but uh, it's usually a very small market, right? If you buy custom-made items, furniture, clothing, you're probably not majority of people. Majority of people get robot made exactly the same kind of Walmart articles, right? So it's not financially sustainable. So this is where I would predict the situations would what jobs will be. Long term, it's not awesome. We need to come up with solutions. People proposed things like essentially redistributing wealth generated by machines. So you tax robots to pay the person whose jobs they replaced. But uh, there is some experiments going on right now and they're not always very promising. Maybe the problem is we need other people's money right now to make it happen. Once you tax robots, it becomes much easier. We don't know. It's still an open question. And there are proposals for unconditional basic assets and conditional support of all sorts. So that's with jobs. I think the second question was, will they outsmart us? So again, we're not talking about robots. Those are bodies. We're talking about AI, software. 
will they outsmart us? So depending on the time scale, today in many narrow domains, they are much smarter than us. A calculator is smarter th than you at basic addition. They are smarter at playing chess. They are starting to be much better at driving cars, at least in certain environments. And more and more, it's hard to name a narrow domain where machines are not superior to us. It's still not the case that they have general intelligence. They're better at us at everything. But uh, a lot of people predict, project, that this is going to happen at some point. So if you can automate a job such as engineer, roboticist, computer scientist, AI researcher, what does that mean? Now you have someone who doesn't need to sleep, eat, works 24-7 on developing the next generation of this technology, right? If you continue this process, you can accelerate all breakthroughs. Right now, a new iPhone comes out, what, every two years? And by the time you figure out the features, the new one came out. Well, if you accelerate the process, you replace all the engineers with automation. Now it comes out every year, every six months, every month, day, minute, second. You can no longer keep up. You become completely irrelevant because you have no idea what's going on around you. And like my parents feel that way about existing technology. They're like, completely lost with what's happening in apps and updates. But it's going to be the case where all of us will not be competitive in this environment. So this idea of uh, exponential growth and intelligence explosion is what frequently called singularity, a point beyond which we cannot make even not unreliable predictions. It's just unknown unknowns. We have no idea what a much smarter, much more capable system thinking million times faster can come up with. The question is, of course, how do we fit in with this technology? Can we control it in some way? And that's a big part of my research. I'm trying to figure out, can a lower intelligence control a higher level intelligence? And it doesn't look good so far. <laughs> uh, I know I'll have some uh, disagreement, but uh, I need maybe half an hour to convince anyone that I'm right, so that's not a problem. Uh, we need to figure out not just how to make sure that humanity is not being replaced in terms of being workers. Most people will be happy to lose their jobs. We need to make sure we're not replaced as humanity. That smarter, more capable, alien-like <clears throat> machines will not take over and will decide, should humans have rights? Should we exist? Is there any benefit to us? Are we just polluting the planet? Should this be fixed? Now, this is very long term. This is not happening Tuesday. So good news. Most of you will probably be OK for a while. But it's something to think about because it's much harder to make a safe and controllable and beneficial system than just to make a capable system, release it. We failed at this many times. The internet was developed. Nobody cared about security or safety. And now it's a nightmare. We're doing it again with Internet 2.0. All those ch cheap products developed, webcams you buy for $10, they have no security built in, so we get hacked every day. The damage is unpleasant, but it's limited. You lose your credit card, they'll replace it, you have to get a new social security number, whatever. It's not a big deal. If you have systems controlling everything, power plants, nuclear grids, stock market, uh, killer robots, so nuclear weapons response, and they make a mistake, they have no safety or security. The damage is huge. You can lose billions of people. You can lose everyone, right? So it's a very different problem. A lot of people have concerns about issues of today. We see um, algorithmic bias, discrimination from machines deciding on credit worthiness, employment opportunities. It's obviously impactful for many people. We see people worry about technological unemployment. Will we have jobs? What are we going to do to feed people? I'm looking at the next level. Will we be around to worry about those things, right? So th this is very interesting because a lot of people who are at the top of the food pyramid in terms of developing AI, the leading companies, Google, DeepMind, OpenAI, are also the same people who agree with this. So this is people who have insider information about how well development is going, what they are capable of doing. So if they say, yeah, it's something to worry about. I'll give money to fund your research. I take it seriously. Uh, finally, I, I want to address the last uh, uh, question we had there with worse. I'm not an expert on uh, weaponized uh, uh, robotics. It's really not necessary for you to answer all the questions. But uh, 
I just want to note that you are certainly not alone in taking the position that, uh, it, 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 that it, uh, artificial intelligence poses a major threat in the sense that they enslave us. So both uh, Steve Hawkins and Professor Arthur Berkeley and the whole group at Oxford, at Oxford support you. Uh, uh, there are some strong names on that list, but I think I want to point out that as technology becomes more available, this good beneficial AI, Google makes it, produces it, makes it available. Now all sorts of crazy people, cults, dictators, have access to it. And it's basically just add your own goals, right? You can make it do whatever you want. So when you say you're not worried about this crazy guy in a basement doing something silly with it, I'm worried about it more than anything because there is no controls for that. I can stop Iran from developing weapons. I cannot stop crazy people in a basement with a laptop from doing something. So there is zero research on stopping malevolent AI. We published one paper on it. Uh, there was one workshop on it, and now a second technical report came out with Oxford, Cambridge, uh, a few top companies on it. So this is all we've done so far from stopping, essentially, hackers trying to get access to intelligent software. Thank you. A different viewpoint. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the fear that artificial intelligence and robotics will create widespread unemployment is preposterous. Martin Ford's book, The Rise of the Robots, spread that fear based on this Oxford University uh, report, which suggested that 47% of jobs were automatable. And that kind of fear spread. But the reality has gone quite against these sources. The uh, employment has grown. Unemployment has dropped below 4%, and automation continues to have positive, positive effects in its application, bringing better lives to many people. That's the story we need to learn, that automation reduces prices, improves quality, and therefore increases demand and improves the lives of people. It makes life better. Yes, there is job disruption. You've characterized it nicely, and I'm, seeing, I'm sympathetic to the, the supportive comments about it. We need to address that. And I will talk about three challenges that we face as technology innovators and as policy makers. But historically, this movement has been going on for hundreds of years. Your Jefferson comment was exactly right. How is it possible that we went from 90% to 2% of people who are making, in the agricultural field, making food. And they've made food for more people. It was the automation that helped. It was also better, uh, better uh, seeds and better farming practices. But the fact is, we have a long history of this evolution. You also talked about the Luddites and the, 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 the fear that uh, uh, looms would put people out of work. And in fact, the looms, dropped the price of a yard of cloth by a factor of 30, a factor of 30, thereby dramatically increasing production, bringing the benefits of having good clothing at low price to many people, and expanded employment in the textile and fashion industries by opening up new opportunities for fashion designers, for distribution outlets, by increasing people's expectations about having one kilt or having four kilts. And all of us have benefited from, the, from this evolution of automation. The fear has also been a consistent theme in history. In 1839, Louis Daguerre announced the birth of photography. French, famed French artist Paul Delaroche, reputed to have said, from today, painting is dead. From today, painting is dead. Well, he did not anticipate the impression start movement and the growth of, of visual movements of many kind. And we today have a large photographic industry and visual communications are central to our lives. And about a billion people a day take a selfie on their own. So the technology advances bring benefits pretty consistently. Yeah, there are some challenges. You talked about the, one of my examples also, the automatic teller machines were supposed to drive widespread unemployment in the banking industry. But as you pointed out, it enabled lower prices to enable more, more branches to be installed 
and the banks expanded their services by providing mortgage lending, credit cards, and other uh, tailored services. And the necessary human interactions were part of that. And so the changing landscape of work is what we have to understand. The narrow view that says, look at these 47% of jobs, we can automate them, does not think about the fact that half a million people sell their homemade arts and crafts on Etsy, that two million people uh, are, are um, eBay salespeople, that I don't know how many now, but around two million people participate in Airbnb, and several million people in the gig economy of Uber and Lyft that I took to come here today. Okay, so the changing nature of work and the new opportunities are what are so dramatic. 20 years ago, healthcare was 12% of employment. Now it's 21%. Somebody took those jobs, okay, including the radiologists and others, which we'll see growing, because, growing opportunities because we're providing better services and we raise people's expectations of what they expect to get in life. And that's the positive thing of technological evolution. But I promised you that there were three challenges we face in this field. I see them as the first one, ensuring safety. We've heard some of those concerns already. But industrial robots can be killers. And, and self-driving cars can be deadly. We need to work intensely as technologists, as policymakers, to ensure safety. And in other forums and other ways, I've written about the idea of a national algorithms safety board modeled on the National Transportation Safety Board with the goal of making automation as safe as aviation. That's where we need to go. There's a technology challenge, there's a policy challenge for how do we supervise the spread of safe technologies. Secondly, the goal is to share the benefits fairly. We've heard some of that through retraining, through better working conditions, uh, through generalized uh, insurance for health care, of better wages. All of those would be ways to improve the quality of work and that will bring, bring great benefits. At the same time, the job retraining, but the creation of new opportunities is what we have to focus on. And these new industries I described, you talked about social media consultants, but the Airbnb, the Etsy, the Uber, and many, many other new forms of industry that are not on the horizon of people who think in a narrow way about the old jobs. But I, and I repeat, that transition has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. The third challenge is limit the harm. Algorithms, artificial intelligence, and robots can be dangerous. The unbiased algorithms are what we see, but the bias is prevalent in so many algorithms. We need to understand, we need to work on it, and make it better. And then, the harmful, malicious actors who use social media technologies to manipulate elections, to provide, to, to support scams and make cyber crime. These are the serious problems. The deflection of attention to saying the fear of jobs going away is not going to help us. What will help us is focusing on these three challenges, okay? These three challenges to ensure safety, to share the benefits, and to limit the harm. But let me close with a higher level thought. I believe that computers and AI are no more intelligent than a wooden pencil. And that we have to celebrate the human creative capabilities. That's where innovation, that's where the future lies. Each generation of creative humans working at the frontiers of knowledge integrates these tools, the tools of machine learning, of face recognition, of neural nets, and puts them to work at ever higher levels. And we have to celebrate and support the capabilities of those individuals who will do these creative works, which will spawn whole new industries and vast opportunities for employment. So there's lots of work to be done. Let's get to it. Thank you.
Uh, in a moment, we'll give you a chance to uh, join the conversation. I just wanted to point out one little thing. The theme which runs through all what we heard, whether about jobs or weapons or about computers outsmarting us, comes down in the end to one question. Uh, can we be in charge of history? Are technological forces getting out of hand, which we cannot control, we can command, or do we have the tools uh, to direct them in uh, productive directions? So when uh, uh, you talk about improving qualities or safeguards, or they all assume effective government. They all assume a, a functioning democracy. And uh, uh, these days, uh, I will not need to finish that thought, I think. <laughs> and so uh, it, the, there are microphones on both ends here. Please join us uh, to raise uh, any questions. It's perfectly OK to ask a single member of the panel. We don't need all questions to be answered by all five people. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question is directed towards Ms. Wareham and Dr. Yampolsky. Um, are we in agreement that artificial intelligence cannot develop self-awareness and its own sense of morality? And if not, then how should we proceed to grant rights to robots and allow them to develop their own societies so as to coexist alongside human societies? Um, I think I can answer yeah. that. So self-awareness is usually not even considered when we talk about dangers of intelligence. You can be very capable optimizer without being self-aware, the philosophical zombie thing. So it's a completely separate question altogether. There is research which shows that artificial neural networks, which are modeled on natural kind, have same types of experiences when it comes to certain inputs. For example, optical illusions. You see things which are not really there you experience an illusion. So it seems that it's possible that the side effect of computation is consciousness. If you can prove that a machine is conscious, you almost have to give it rights, protect it from feeling pain and so on. In fact, European Parliament is looking at granting certain rights to robots. But uh, I don't think today we have anything to worry about with causing harms to machines. It's more about the other direction. I think uh, recently Saudi Arabia granted uh, citizenship to uh, a robot called Sophia, uh, which I appeared on a, a panel with earlier this year. And, and that's a remote controlled uh, talking box, basically, which is programmed to give uh, pre programmed uh, responses. Uh, you know, it, it's a good example of, of showing how something that is not sophisticated should not be given personhood or citizenship, especially uh, in a country such as Saudi Arabia, where, where women have only just been given the right to drive. Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of a, it's a bit of a distracting issue, uh, and it's one that is a lightning rod I've heard for the roboticists and for the artificial intelligence experts who are, who are more concerned about the impact on, on people rather than when we give these, these kind of uh, things, you know, uh, those, those kind of rights. So nobody's talking about giving them rights at the moment in any serious way other than Saudi Arabia. Just a follow-up on that. Under current law, today's law, because of corporate personhood, you can get personhood to AI, existing thing. Yeah, this question is a, is a specific instance as an illustration of perhaps a, uh, an issue. By the way, thank you very much. Excellent panel. Um, IBM Watson, as an AI, inter um, artificial intelligence, apparently um, after years and years and years of development and billions of dollars, I guess, of investments, is not doing very well uh, for some reason. Apparently, you know, part of it to be designed to help doctors, physicians in diagnosis of you know, cancer, for example, is um, providing the same answers that a doctor would be. So it's not really adding any value. Is it, in, your, in the panel's opinion, a more of a technical issue here? Or is AI, at least in this example, hitting some kind of a wall where physicians and doctors are making much more complex sets of decisions, or is it just a technical issue uh, that is, you know, by Tuesday is going to be resolved? <laughs> Thank you. 
So who has the answer? Well, let me just, what you reminded me of something that I wanted to, uh, you reminded me of something I wanted to come back to uh, that is related to your question, uh, maybe somewhat tangential while, while, while the other geniuses here figure out the right answer. Uh, so somebody quoted a study that showed that um, accountants were going to be replaced by robots, um, much in the same way that I think some decisions by physicians would be made by robots and surgeons are uh, looking at, uh, at, at replacement uh, issues as well right now. Um, what it turned out was that when they went back and redid, uh, took a deeper dive at that question, it turned out that accountants actually spend a lot of time meeting with each other, trying to figure out stuff that was way beyond the capacities of AI as it exists today. And so they actually had to take the accountants pretty much off the list. If you think of accountancy as just putting stuff in a spreadsheet, sure, of course that's automatable. But in fact, actually read the transcript of uh, uh, the, those uh, genius accountants, Paul Manafort and uh, Rick Gates, and you see, that, <laughs> you see that they're actually doing some other stuff there. Uh, now th those guys are uh, out there, no question. But my point is that uh, it turns out that that 47% or 46% from that, this was a, an Oxford study, that said 46% of jobs are automatable. It turned out it was, when, when they re -bat, went back and looked at the interactions between people, that fell to 9%. And so I think what may be happening, an example <laughs> that you're talking about, is that there are interactions between humans that get ahead of the AI pretty quickly. Now, the way, the, the way I think futurists or technologists talk about this is that you can actually train AI to, to, have, uh, to um, kind of simulate the same types of interactions, but I, I expect that that's you know, many decades off. I'll just go back to the Watson. It's another, yet another example of failures of AI. It, as you say, billions of dollars invested. One of my former PhD students was working there, so I have a particular uh, insight uh, from those stories, but read the detailed reviews of the failure, and it's partially a marketing failure of over-promising, but IBM itself, which is an admirable company, deluded itself into believing these notions. And the $50 million effort with Sloan Kettering was the example you were getting to where it did not prove out. And it, to me, represents, again, the false model put forward through the AI world to assume that the machines are smart or intelligent, are getting smarter than we are. Nonsense. Nonsense. Preposterous. People are not computers. Computers are not people. Computers have no more intelligence than a wooden pencil. They're merely tools. And the sooner we come to understand that we will build advanced, still more advanced technologies based on these tools will get us more quickly to the position of responsibility that will respond to the concerns you have about autonomous weapons will get us more clearly to the responsibility for providing better employment and better jobs. So to me, clarifying responsibility is central. The false and curious belief that the machines will be our collaborators, our partners, our friends, or our overlords is just preposterous. I think a hundred years from now, people will look back at the early part of the 20th century and smile with the bizarre, at the bizarre belief that people thought that computers would be intelligent. Uh, uh, just for a quick, taking apart Watson, I think there's a lot of really compelling examples of how AI-driven technology is assisting in medical diagno diagnosis in a lot of areas. So Watson is a very high-profile one, but I don't think we should discredit the fact that there's actually been huge advances in health. The fact that a machine can have in its database so many examples of so many things that one person can't possibly hold in their mind. I think the potential in the health space is, is, is great, and um, Watson, I think, is a disappointment. A lot of people in the AI space think there's big winters ahead and obstacles, but when I look at the trends, particularly in how technology can assist in diagnosing disease, I think if it's If you incredible. shift to the model no, 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 that no, no, says no, 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 assist, sir, you've sir, got the right sir. idea. We have a lot of people <laughs> want to ask questions, please. Uh, all right, um, Tom Riley, Big Moon Dig. The uh, technical literature says that uh, uh, I, uh, I inter, um, chipsets to run uh, deep learning are going to be on the market next Tuesday. 
All right, so maybe it's January, but they will make AIs cheap, powerful, and low power consuming. I'm saying that that will result in every manager on the planet who has a job will have an AI built into his cell phone that is one of his people. And it does all the work with the uh, deep, uh, the big data sets and will produce graphics of this is what my corporation is going to do in 3D, animated, that will knock your socks off. And anybody who doesn't do that is going to be out of a job. And so the question is, how are we going to control when the AI chips just take over everything? <laughs> and that's about next Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, when we get another two question, then uh, please. Well, actually, I've got two short questions. One is put this on a global scale. And uh, China has made a commitment that it's going to be the world leader in AI in the next seven years. Could you talk about that a little bit and how it affects it, especially, uh, Ms. Warman, the, uh, the military issues related to that? The second one is a little more complicated, but is there a Turing test? Is that important in this? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got Blade Runner ideas of replicants, which, serve, which is, may or may not be important. But to your point about creative jobs, we know that creative jobs are already being done by AI, newspaper, business sections, sports sections, easily automated. Uh, I just wrote a report about uh, music and art being done by AI. Uh, not hard to do, and creating a whole new opportunity, and probably manned and programmed by human beings at some point. But if you could talk about both of those sort of get into that international issue as well. Thank you. I could maybe just say a few words about China. Uh, we know that China is, is, is developing military applications of artificial intelligence and it's investing heavily in uh, autonomous weapon systems along with a handful of other countries, the United States and Russia, Israel and South Korea uh, and the United Kingdom. They're all investing heavily in military applications of AI and in autonomy and weapon systems. The other thing that's happening in China, of course, is that there are investments across the board by the governments in these for other, other reasons. And I think you've already covered this in a previous talk about surveillance, uh, but, but China is using uh, AI to surveil certain segments of its population, the, the Uyghur population in particular, uh, being catalogued and uh, tracked. Uh, it's using facial recognition uh, technology to, to monitor its own population, not just uh, kids going to school or people crossing the street, uh, but in ways that you, you can't even imagine. My colleague at Human Rights Watch has been very good at digging down into the research there. I think because China realizes that there are so many concerns about those more nefarious uses of AI to surveil its own population, it's decided to try and be the good guy in the killer robots talks and call for a prohibition. Uh, when we talk to China about, do, do you, are you serious? Do you really wish to prohibit fully autonomous weapons? They said to us, yes, but on use only, not development or production. So for us, we're like, well, this is only part way. We're, you know, we're, how's, how's that going to work? But we, we take that at face value and we put China on the list of the 26 countries now who are calling for a prohibition. And China, by calling for a prohibition, has said that existing law is insufficient and we do need to have something specific uh, to killer robots. And in that respect, China has done us a favor because none of the other permanent members of the Security Council take that position at the moment. They're all saying existing law will cover it, everything will be fine. Uh, when we know that we need to have the rules here. And maybe just to respond earlier, we talked about the guy in the basement and how I am worried about the guy in the basement in the same Old way. girl. In the same way that I am about uh, landmines, for example, we, I've worked for the last two decades trying to ensure that the international treaty prohibiting anti-personnel landmines is functioning. And I can tell you that it is a story of good news that anti-personnel mines are not being manufactured in the vast quantities that they were in the 1970s and 80s. The stocks have been destroyed and are still being destroyed. Uh, and these weapons are not being used by civilized, you know, fighting forces uh, of nations, including the United States, who is using them. Non-state armed groups such as ISIS in uh, Iraq and in Syria, and that is down to the individual. 
and their decisions. So when we call for a prohibition, we call for a ban in part because we don't see a series of complicated rules and regulations being followed by everybody. We want everybody to know that it is wrong to remove human control from the selection of targets and the use of force. Everybody from the greatest military power right down to that non-state armed group, that individual who seeks to make that weapon. Well, just one line on China. First of all, it's not at all proven that if you pour a lot of money into something, you get results. So the notion that we're going to invest a lot in AI, therefore they're going to become the leading force, we should not take it for granted. But if they do, it's time for payback. We, in the past, had huge outlays on R&D, and then they copied what we produced. If they're going to go on ahead in AI and come with something with new, it's time we copy something from them, I guess. Uh, hello. Uh, Dr. Yampolsky, I uh, take a bit of a different position than you do. I, I happen to see the end in sight or that it is here and that we should be more than just worried about it, as well as uh, Ms. Kinder. Um, I think that I love technology. I wear a, um, a, uh, an Apple phone, an iPhone watch, a tablet at home, the whole works. Um, but this country, as, as, as many others, have gotten into, uh, like the movie where it says greed is good, that if you wave enough money in front of somebody's hands, they don't care what it is, they'll sign any piece of legislation you want uh, without worrying about what happens to the, the, the end user, the human guy. They give a rat's patootie about whether I'm able to pay my mortgage, et cetera, anybody else. Um, my credit union, you mentioned a few minutes ago about them using a... Um, almost an ATM, how it's gotten faster. No, don't worry. Well, worry. TEFCU, the Transportation Employees Federal Credit Union, went from having six people in this building to three. And this is in less than a year. You walked in one day, I said, this is a bad idea. Oh, this is great. This is technology. You'll love it. Come in. You do this, do that. I said, you're going to be gone. Didn't believe it. Six months later, boom, three people are gone. Not moved to another division, not moved to another area. These are people that had decent jobs where they could pay their bills and go home every day. Gone. Go across the street to the Safeway, to the uh, CVS. On any given Friday, which was a payday for most folks, or if it was the first of the month, whether it was a retirement or whether you were on assistance, the stores were full, the lines were backed up, you could get in and out with full of groceries. What do they do? They automated the stores. We have three people to, to possibly run the, the registers. Now you go in and you check yourself out. I didn't go to school so I could become a bag boy and check my own stuff out, but that's what happens. Now you check your own groceries out, and they don't pay you for it. But what happened to those other nine people that had good government jobs, they had pensions, they had benefits, they were able to feed their families, they, they provided a tax base for the neighborhood. They gave a rat's patootie about it when they said, look, we can do more with less. And finally, someone walks into our office one day and says, look, you can get rid of 15 of these people. We got this new computer program that can do all of these things and out the door you can do with them. You'll make this much money. They told all those people, you're gone. You're done. So what happened to us? In Ms. Ms. Kendi, you said uh, you keep training up. And I, I agree with you. You can train and train and train. but your position and your, your, your assistant, your virtual assistant, uh, handles a job of 10 people. And you train up next year and it handles a job of 100 people. And then a year after that, it's 300 people. Well, at some point, they don't need you. Now, you can keep training, but you're gone. So what happens to the person that trains three levels above you? At some, it, it, it just ends. All of a sudden, the machine takes over and you're gone. Good, so good what do question. we do? That's great. What are you I'm gonna happy. Do, what are you gonna do? Yes. Um, I, I thought that was great for a, a bunch of reasons. I think there's this tendency, especially for those of us who work every day thinking about these trends, to almost assume everything's inevitable, especially when it comes to technology. We were just chatting earlier where there's some things like trade that feels like an active decision. Technology is sort of this force. And there's this almost sense of this: these robots are coming, this technology is being created. But that really ignores a few things. One. Technology might exist, but businesses and employers have to decide how they're going to actually roll this out. How is this actually going to affect your staff and your employees? Stop, there stop, is, stop, stop. yeah. No, no, no. 
But I, I haven't gotten to my other two points, so let me just finish. So I think there needs to be a discussion also of what's ethical. I mean, there's not really one. In all these discussions from a business point of view, the technology might exist, but how someone decides to deploy that in terms of, that's how the rubber is going to hit the road for employment. It's not what's happening in Silicon Valley. It's how it's deployed. So one, I think there's a question about the conversation about what's just and what's right and what's right for the workforce. The second is individuals. How are we in this this conversation. I know there are certain aspects of technological change that we face. Are we going to get into an autonomous vehicle or not? Are we going to do the self-checkout or not? What do we tolerate? Are we going to support a business that's automating in a way that we don't think is just? So I think there's sort of an individual choice. But you're even going to a step higher, which is what is society going to tolerate? What's right? When we're thinking about the way the economy's going, what, is, what, is, what are we going to support? And I think we have to sort of remove a little bit of the sense of inevitability. I also do think some of this stuff does happen. I mean, technological change has been happening for a long time. We can't fully stop it, but I think you raised some really important questions about what do we tolerate, what does society tolerate, what's the right policy, and what do employers do? Excuse me, but we've dumbed sir, down America sir, to accept sir, everything. Go sir, ahead, I, I apologize. We have only 10 minutes. Yeah. Why don't we give the other people but I appreciate chance. those comments very much. Okay. Well, um, I have two comments. First of all, the big elephant in the room to me is the fact that what defines a human being is a type of intelligence that we haven't even talked about. It's the intelligence of the heart and the intelligence of the soul that is so intangible in the Western culture. But uh, again, I think the beauty of artificial intelligence is the fact that it shows so clearly that there's more to life than just the brain and the answers. And then the second piece that I wanted to mention to Roman is I'm not a very smart person. So when I hear about Einstein or I try to read his books, his letters to his family, oh, I think, what a smart guy. But I'm not even touching things. But what I wonder about is, is there a type of intelligence that no human being can say, what are they thinking? So we can't follow it to even justify whether we want to do it or not, or whether it brings us to any place that we want to go to, because it's got a mind of its own. And that's the singularity that I understood is coming. The kind that is beyond words, the kind that comes up with answers that we have no way to scrutinize. That's it. All right agree with that, but also it's happening today. Explainability is an unsolved problem with existing deep neural networks. We make decisions, but we don't know how the decisions are made, so yes. So as a uh, trained economist, I don't really uh, do much with the heart and the soul, uh, <laughs> but, you, uh, 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 but I think you get to the nub of something really important here. Um, and um, um, Molly was talking about the ethics of how these technologies map onto society as a policy choice. And I completely agree with the intersection of what the two of you are talking about. And it's kind of where I was trying to come from in my comments, which is that I, and, and this, is, this goes a little bit against what you were saying, sir. So, so just a lot, and maybe we can talk afterwards and argue afterwards about this. Because I think if you listen to your rap, you would think that there were a, 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 there, there, the unemployment rate now would be three or four times what it is. So I, I still think that there uh, is, is strong demand for workers. By the way, my 16-year-old was just went out to find a job, and her mom and I were harassing her to go out and get a job. Well, in like an hour, she had two job offers. So <laughs> that led me to believe that the labor market really is very tight. Now, this is very present-oriented. But I actually think that down the road, and I think Ben is in the same place that I, that, that, that there will be employment. But the question of the quality of that employment is a policy decision that we can make. And there are a number of steps that we can take that will make those jobs good jobs or lousy jobs. And I guess the, the point that we haven't touched on enough in today's panel has to do with economic inequality. If there were too little wealth and income being generated by everything we're talking about today, including te technological advancement, the option of making jobs better jobs wouldn't be on the table. There simply wouldn't be the resources. But there are. Uh, in fact, profitability is through the roof. The problem is its distribution. So I think the intersection of you know, what you're calling heart and soul, and I think what Molly is talking about as ethics, and, a, and an intentional policy 
that recognizes that in the future there's going to be jobs, but the quality of those jobs could be uh, really under threat, would lead at least me to a policy set that makes sure that the distribution of the resources that the economy creates, including through technological advances, is, is much more equitably shared than it is now. Thank you. Dr. Etienne's initial example of the thermostat in my house, which is going to know what I want two weeks from now, terrifies me. <laughs> I read 1984 when that date was several decades in the future, and it seemed like it would never come. Today, when I read it, I think Orwell lacked imagination. You know, he projected that there would be cameras around that would follow us. Oh, heavens, really? Everywhere. The alley, the store, your house, you name it. The video that checks on your dog, on your dog sitter. Everywhere that we go, in our cars, with our, with our phones, when we check ways to see what the traffic is, somebody knows we've checked and where we are. Facial recognition to open the lock on the door also tells somebody through artificial intelligence who might want to know where we are. You gave the wonderful example in China of the surveillance of the Uyghurs. That, I think, is a great concern. There are fewer and fewer democratically controlled countries. Autocracies are taking, in the last year, greater power in countries we thought were solidly about humans. And I am worried, and I ask you, is it too late to protect us from all the information about us that is easily accessed? But it's a very, very, very I think that's what it's really all about. And so the question is, are we going to deal with these challenges, which you point to are very serious, by stopping technological development, if you even could? or by realizing that we need a, a government which is much more effective, which can protect both the ethical, not just rely on everybody making the right choices, provide the kind of quality uh, things uh, Jared talked about. So in the end, it's not a question, are the technology inherently good or bad? It's a question, do we have the tools to control them, or are they in the end going to control us? Now, if it was very, very rude, I would ask you if you have a smartphone, but I'm not going to do that. But it illustrates the point I'm making. It's very difficult for us to resist the technologies. As the question is, uh, how can we get on top of them other than for them in effect? Dominera is not in the sense that uh, some of my uh, colleagues at Oxford believe they go on and enslave us. And we, we, they make, uh, one of them thinks that they're going to turn, turn all raw materials into paper clips. I mean, I, I'm not talking about these foul scenarios, but it's exactly the way you describe it, that uh, uh, these technologies have all kinds of implications. Like, for instance, some of the systems discriminate. Uh, some of them uh, uh, do provide excessive surveillance. So the question is, stop technology or get, get on top of it. Last question, please. Hi, y'all. Thank you for your time, first off. Um, my question is mainly about education. Mm -hmm. um, I have an undergrad in elementary education, and I have a master's in IT. So my thing is, when you go to the professors, they always ask you, like, they always train you for that one job as if you're going to stay there forever. Mm -hmm. However, they never really train you up to move along in your industry or utilize your skills across industries. So I understand this is about technology, and y'all and y'all talked about education at some point. However, do you guys think that the education system should change at least from the undergrad perspective, as if you go to school for your first year, and then you go to work for maybe a year or two, and then you come back for your second year, and so forth, so you can stay on top of the technologies as well as uh, just maintaining your own lifestyle at the same time. So instead of you being broke for, you know, the four years that you're trying to go to school, and then you come out, you making maybe 30000 that's how it was right? um, with my education degree. I just couldn't deal with it, so that's why I switched over to technology. So thank you. Bravo for your focusing on the processes of education that should be more integrated with the real world, giving students the experience of work, putting them in project-oriented teams so they learn what it's like to work. 
and they will then develop the skills that they need to continuously retrain themselves and to build a better life on a, on a continuing basis as the technology evolves. I'm very heartened by what I've heard, your, your call for the focus on the emotional side, the interest in the ethical, and the focus on good jobs and fair and a, and a just society. All that's very positive, and all of it depends on our coming together and asserting our confidence that the human creative potential is unique, distinctive, and powerful. We can build a better world. It's up to us to do it. It requires hard work, but there's lots of work to be done. Um, I just have one quick point. I'm going to uh, uh, paraphrase someone who's much more intelligent than me on this particular question. The president of Arizona State University is one of the most dynamic, innovative thinkers on higher ed. His name is Michael Crow. We hosted him for an event on the future of work. He said that he's reorienting that system to create master learners. This idea that you are going to have to continuously learn throughout your life. It's not so much the specific knowledge you're getting from your degree. It's the general knowledge of how to learn and how to consistently learn throughout your career. And how do you change the university system so that in five years when you want to pivot, you can come and access that. So it's the way you learn when you're in school to, to be able to continue learning. And then this ability to come and do lifelong learning throughout your career I think is really crucial. Well, we have three minutes. I'm going to ask the panel to exercise a, a new talent. Be very brief. And <laughs> each one of you get a chance to tell us one or two sentences. Can we get on top of that? Are there any reason, to, any signs? We need to go to find the tools, the political tools, uh, to make these decisions. Let's go in the opposite order, Ben, when we start with you. <laughs> I think I've made my point. I am generally optimistic about the future. It does take a commitment on all of us to assert the human qualities that we respect, to, res to celebrate the creative potentials of humans, to teach them better, to exercise their creative potentials, to innovate, to be entrepreneurs. Many universities, University of Mellon, Arizona State, uh, Northeastern, one after another, you'll hear the stories that design thinking, entrepreneurship, and getting involved on a project basis with teams, with other people, that's where learning happens. So uh, I'll just make you realize that today, as of right now, no one in the world has a working AI safety control mechanism. No one has a prototype and some people don't think it's a problem. I'd say that the campaign to stop killer robots is at the forefront of regulation, and it might sound old-fashioned, uh, but we still believe that treaties, that laws, that, that, that those things do work. Um, but it's not just up to us and our governments to take action. Everybody has to. And in that respect, I think there's an awakening happening out in California from the technology workers themselves who realize the owner, onerous responsibility that they have in developing this kind of tech. And they're pushing their bosses to do the right thing. So in June, Google came out with the first set of ethical principles from that organization. And it's just a set of principles. It's just guidance. But for me, we won a successful, you know, we won something in that because they committed not to develop or design artificial intelligence for use in weapons. And that was one of the clearest parts of the ethical principles that they put out. Uh, a lot of other parts of it are, are less clear and are more confusing, I think, because they need to hear direct from people as to what concerns them and what needs to be done. So sorry, that's a sh long answer, but thank you. I think the future of work and the safety of technology, which are the two main topics today, will be what we make of them. And what we make of them is very much a function of the political context within which they take place. And the current politics in this country is chaotic, is backward looking, is motivated by racial divisiveness, by greed, and bodes terribly for any question you want to raise, whether it's technology or anything else. So my view, <laughs> so, Solving this problem is secondary to solving the, co the problem of political context. Great. Uh, I think my summary is change is coming. Change is always hard. But some people are going to feel this in worse way than others, and those are the people who are already vulnerable today. I don't think we're ready. 
Um, and I think if we don't get this right, we risk growing the inequality that's already harming our country and putting the American dream out of reach for so many people. I invite you all to come back on September 16, when our subject is going to be, there are no deplorables here, and we'll be bringing together uh, some people who are Trump supporters and some people who are Trump critics for the ultimate test of a civil dialogue. Yeah. Uh, for, to for today, please join me to thank the panel for an excellent performance. <laughs>